Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for today's webinar. My name is Elisa Asmelash, and I'm from the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. Hopefully, most of you know about IRENA, but in case not, we are an intergovernmental organization with 162 member countries. We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as a platform for international cooperation, center of excellence, and repository of policy, technology, resource, and financial knowledge on renewable energy. Our analytical work and our engagement with our member countries generates a lot of valuable insights, and we're constantly looking for more ways to share them. This is why we have launched the fortnightly IRENA Insights webinar program. So every other week, presenters from one of IRENA's team, either alone or together with other invited guests, will share key uh, findings from their latest work, as well as insights into opportunity, uh, trends, best practices, but also innovative solutions to address various challenges. We aim to keep this webinar short, uh, approximately 30 minutes, so we cannot cover everything, but we hope to give you enough to decide whether to delve deeper and we will sign for, signpost further sources for more in-depth information to help you to do that. Today's webinar will be on net zero iron and steel production, challenges, options, and what, it, what needs to happen now. The iron and steel sector is a major energy user and a major emitter of CO2 emissions. In 2017, the sector accounted for 32 exajoules of total global final energy use, and in 2018, it produced between 7 and 9% of total global CO2 emissions. Drawing on the analysis presented in IRENA's Reaching Zero with Renewables report and building on key takeaways from the discussions of the third IRENA Innovation Week, this webinar will provide insights into the challenges that the, the sector faces and the main options and actions needed for deep decarbonization of the sector. Our speaker today is Dr. Paul Durant, our IRENA expert. The presentation will be approximately 20 minutes to allow um, an additional 10 minute sessions for questions and answers. But before I hand over the microphone to Paul, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Today's webinar will be recorded and available together um, with uh, other material on ARENA's website, uh, webinar website. The previous webinar recording and slides are already there and the link will be shared with you in a follow-up email. All of you are currently muted and will remain uh, so throughout the webinar. We would love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for our speakers, please feel free to send it through the question feature that you can find on the webinar panel. We will be monitoring the questions throughout the session and select some to be answered by our, our speakers. Due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if your questions uh, are not answered. Uh, you may also download the reports um, on which this presentation is based on in the handout se section. And if you experience any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect by dialing in via phone. You can get the number by clicking on the phone option located on the webinar panel. If your technical difficulties remain unsolved, you may write to us through the chat section and we will try to help. So without any further ado, let me kick things off and welcome Paul Durant. Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Elisa, and many thanks to you all for joining us today. So this is going to be quite a quick canter through what is quite an involved topic. But as Elisa says, it's about giving you a flavor of some of the work Irene is doing on this topic and hopefully some pointers as to where you can dive in further. So before I get in specifically to iron and steel, let me put it in a sort of broader context of why why iron and steel is a critical sector here and some of what we're doing. So um, for the last five years or so, uh, one of the major things that IRENA has done is publish an annual report outlining a roadmap to 2050 for deep decarbonization. Uh, the one we published in spring of this year was called the Global Renewables Outlook. Um, and that, as in the previous five years before that, had focused on a pathway to well below two degrees consistent with the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Now that pathway looks challenging uh, but with the right support looked achievable. However um, in recent years in literally in the last year or so perhaps slightly longer than that the policy debate has been shifting and ambition has been growing and there is a growing desire to focus on uh, the more challenging goal of achieving one point uh, holding temperature rises to no more than 1.5 degrees 
Now, if 80% or so CO2 reduction needed for well below two degrees looked tough, then the net zero uh, emissions goal necessary to hold the line at 1.5 degrees looks really tough, and particularly so in some sectors. Now, we're seeing signs that decision makers are waking up to what is needed to deliver that ambitious trajectory, uh, but that's not yet really translating into concrete plans uh, and into real actions. And outside of a group of those who sort of specialize in this topic, there's still a sort of great deal of uh, missing understanding and gaps and perhaps even some confusion over what the options are and what the actions are needed. So at the request of our member countries, 162 member countries for IRENA now, we have been looking at what needs is needed to address that and trying to collect good practice and provide advice to our member countries. We're starting to build an understanding. Many un uncertainties remain, but we're starting to get a handle on some of the key points. Now, key things that if you want to know more about the work you could uh, take a look at was our Global Renewables Outlook report from last year. Um, uh, which we then expanded upon with a deep dive into industry and transport, which we called Reaching Zero with Renewables. It's extracts from that work that I'll be mainly talking to you about today. But in addition to that, a variety of other ways in which we're engaging with our members. So I'll highlight just a couple. Uh, the IRENA Virtual Innovation Week, which took place in early October. Uh, you see the stats there on the screen, very well attended. We had an excellent discussion about some of the challenges and the exciting innovative solutions that are emerging to address those challenges. And if you want to know more, there's a summary of all of those discussions on the website, plus all the recordings. Um, in addition, countries are showing strong signs of wanting to come together around key elements of the transition. And one of those key elements is hydrogen. We have our collaborative framework on green hydrogen that's bringing countries and the private sector together. So that's the wider work, but let's talk specifically about iron and steel. So our global renewables outlook, as I said, uh, focused on well below two degrees scenario. But for the first time last year, we uh, took a look at what was needed to reach a net zero emissions target. And we called that our deep decarbonization perspective, and that's the lower bar on the screen. And you can see um, what our assessment of the key components necessary to drive current emissions across all aspects of energy and associated process emissions down to zero looked like. Within that, there are a number of sectors that look particularly challenging. For some sectors, such as the power sector, there is a heck of a lot of work still to be done, but we have a reasonable understanding of what the, the right solutions look like. Delivery is a challenge, but we know the broad pathway. But some other sectors, particularly heavy freight, um, long distance transport, and heavy industry, which account for significant shares of emissions under current policies, the trajectory, the optimum pathway is far less clear. And on current policies, we see those emissions are set to rise, not fall, on the time scale of 2050. So that's why we dived into those particular sectors. Next slide, please. In particular, four industry sectors and three transport sectors. I'll focus in on one of those industry ones here today. Um, why those sectors? Well, they're significant sources of, of both energy use and emissions. 38% of energy process emissions and 43% of final energy use by 2050 unless major policy changes are pursued. And progress in those sectors has been slow. We've seen some efficiency improvements, but annual emissions in the industry increased uh, in recent years, not decreased, and are set to increase uh, through to 2050 unless we implement new policies. In addition, the share of renewables in those sectors Next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, share of renewables in those uh, policies, sorry, those sectors is relatively low, very low in fact. Now, two things have changed uh, in recent years that gives us some cause for optimism that we can make progress in these hard to abate sectors. Firstly, is that strong and widening societal recognition and that growing political consensus on the need for all sectors to make deep cuts in carbon emissions. We've now seen uh, the leaders uh, of all G20, G7 countries have made pledges 
to achieve net zero. The EU has such a target, and in, in total, there are over 30 now uh, major economies around the world that have committed to net zero emissions. Uh, particularly notably just in the last couple of months, China made a commitment by 2060, Japan and Korea made commitments by 2050 just in the last few months. So that's, that political will uh, is growing and solidifying, but secondly we've seen a rapid decline in the cost of renewables over the past decade and the further potential for further cost reductions and scaling up of key renewable sources. And that opens up options for these sectors that previously looked unattractive, unaffordable, and were perhaps previously dismissed. Next slide, please. Our report covers all of these things. I'm going to get to iron and steel in just a moment. Um, but in general, we've shown that there's a huge potential for renewable use, much more than previous analysis has identified. We estimate that around 54% of the economic emission abatement potential across those seven sectors could come from renewables. That includes both the direct use of renewables in electricity, um, the direct use of renewables as through renewable fuels, and the indirect use of renewables uh, by the creation of carriers, uh, in particularly hydrogen, but other onward carriers such as ammonia or methanol. Efficiency, circular economy comments are important. CCUS will have an important role to play in industry, uh, but renewables is doing a lot of the heavy lifting, so perhaps the role of CCS can be less than, than we previously assumed. So let's dive now into iron and steel. So um, why focus on iron and steel and what's the current status? Well, under current policies, iron and steel will be 8% of global CO2 emissions by 2050. That's 2.9 gigatons of emissions. Clearly, steel is a critical material for industrial de development and is strategically important industry for a number of countries, particularly those that are major steel producers. It's a complex sector and it faces significant challenges before we even get to the emission reduction challenges. There is strong competition between countries, uh, steel is traded regionally and globally. There are typically low profit margins. There are issues of volatile demand. There are currently, and for a while now, issues of overcapacity in the market. And there are geopolitical issues uh, because steel is often very much associated with national growth strategies uh, for a particular country and therefore is of critical political importance. All of that has been made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the global economy. So the steel industry we had challenges beforehand, that has been exacerbated uh, this year and the, we'll see the ripple effects of that for many years to come. I wanna make an important point about, uh, about the link between steel and development and why decarbonizing steel is not a simple, well, we need to decarbonize steel, but we need to do so in a way that still allows countries to produce the steel they need for their industrial uh, development. Let's take India as an example. So India um, produced uh, 9.8 megatons of steel in 2018. That was a 7.5% growth on the previous year. So you can see their, their growth was, was scaling up. Their use per capita is only 64 kilograms. Back, oops, slides are jumping around. Let's stick with that slide, thank you. Uh, is only 64 kilograms of, um, per person. Um, that compares to a global average of 224 kilograms. And indeed, if one looks at, at, at where um, major developed economies have peaked in terms of their steel demand, that's around 500 kilograms. So you can see India as one example, a large example, but just one example, current steel use is 64 kilograms versus that peak of 500. India, of course, wants to continue to, to grow and to grow its economy increased use of steel is going to be a, a critical part of that and we need low carbon ways of enabling that. So let's look at the options uh, and the choices to be made in the steel sector. So well as with all sectors efficiency should be the starting point. Energy efficiency certainly can help and has been a big focus in the industry in recent years. That generally helps with cost reduction and can help somewhat with interim emission reduction measures. But energy efficiency alone is not consistent with getting us to zero emissions. Materials efficiency is more critical. 
And so as countries develop, they can expect demand to grow, as I just said. And so it's not about preventing growth, it's about using, utilizing uh, the material as efficiently as possible. Steel is nearly always recycled and is recycled at high rates. There's a little bit of scope to go further in terms of uh, greater steel recycling, but not a great deal. Beyond that, therefore, it's got to be about low carbon ways of producing steel. There are various options and technologies that people have been experimenting with over the years. But if our focus is on getting close to zero emissions, and if we sort of cut through the distractions of some of the niche options, our choices essentially boil down to two main routes, the renewables route or the CCS route. Next slide, please. Now, both options are technically viable in the sense that they're based on established technologies but neither of them are well developed or really ready yet for mass scale up. In both cases, we see only a couple of pilots or a couple of operational plants anywhere in the world. And both have significant implications for infrastructure decisions. Uh, they have implications for power, for hydrogen supply, and potentially for the, uh, for the transportation and storage of CO2. Briefly to focus on the CCS route, because today we're focused mainly on renewables, CCS route's big advantage is it can be applied to existing processes. So the dominant process for steel production right now is to use a blast furnace followed by a basic oxygen furnace. CCS can be applied to that process um, without fundamental changes in the underlying uh, steel production uh, process. But equally, CCS could be applied to other steel making processes, including the direct reduction of ions. A couple of caveats. The best capture rates, and these are somewhat theoretical at the moment, so not completely proven in the sector, are around 90% of CO2 emitted. And there is only one operational steel plant in the world right now using CCUS. That's a natural gas-based uh, direct reduction iron plant uh, in the United Arab Emirates, which uses the captured CO2 for um, enhanced oil recovery. There are plans for more in development, but it will be a while yet, it will be well into the 2020s before we see uh, those um, bearing fruit. And there are remain uncertainties around cost and practicalities. So CCS is certainly a viable option in this sector, but it has challenges, as I just said. The alternative, and the one that is more consistent with a complete decarbonization of the sector eventually, is the use of direct reduced iron followed by an electric arc furnace. Now this is an established technology uh, currently using methane uh, and iron mixture as, as, it, as its feedstock. It can however be constructed to operate with green, i.e. Hydro green hydrogen, i.e. hydrogen produced from renewables. With DRI, the, the supply of hydrogen, both the supply and the cost is the challenge. Low cost electricity is an important game changer for the production of green hydrogen and therefore steel production. At the moment, we see that the cost differential between a DRI, a green DRI plant and a traditional blast furnace is around $67 per tonne of CO2. That cost differential can be reduced through, the, through um, lower cost uh, hydrogen production, through low cost renewable electricity. And we see positive signs that in the next decade, the cost of hydrogen can be decreased substantially. There's a couple of pilots underway, uh, both of them in Europe, one in Sweden, one in Germany. And both of them are set to continue for several years yet before they are proven. So again, I'm illustrating that point that we're really at the early stage of this. We've got this couple of pilots, be it in CCS or in green DRI-based hydrogen production. Um, when, so we're not yet at the, the stage of having multiple demonstration projects ready for, for major scale-up. Interesting thing with DRI is it potentially opens up some opportunities for the export of DRI and for the location of, of DRI production close to good sources of renewables, particularly good sources of renewables to generate that hydrogen. A couple of last points in terms of the transition and the way in which we, we need to progress. So time is something somewhat against us here. Uh, given that neither route is yet fully established and that steel plants are a major capital investment with long lifetimes, 
we need to be acting in the 2020s to ensure that the plants that we're building in the 2020s are consistent with at least a uh, decarbonisation strategy that leads us to net zero by 2050. So the decade, the 2020s is a decade for consolidating changes in the power sector and preparing for deep decarbonisation of other sectors. By 2030 at the latest, frankly, ideally a bit sooner than that, any new plant needs to be compatible with zero emissions. Now that doesn't need, means it needs to be zero emissions from the start, but it does need a clear pathway to transition. So in the case of hydrogen DRI, that can be the use of non-green hydrogen, if that's not too confusing, i.e. hydrogen produced from fossil fuels, as long as there is a pathway to transition to low carbon hydrogen, such as green hydrogen produced from renewables. In the case of CCS, it's preparing for the retrofit of CCS to your steel plant at a later date. And that's not as simple as just putting the technology on there. One needs to think about the location of the plant, the ease of transportation of CO2, access to appropriate storage, uh, and, or in the case of DRA, access to low-cost hydrogen. So a lot of sort of complicated choices we have to make over the next five to 10 years to make sure that we're in the right state in the 2030s to really uh, accelerate the uptake of green, clean steel production. So just wrapping up here now in terms of sort of next steps, next slide, please. Skip over that one. Oops, one more. Thank you. So. In our Reaching Zero with Renewable report, we made a number of sector-specific recommendations, but we also focused on a number of priorities for action in general across these industry sectors. Ten high-level recommendations, and they're unpacked in the report, um, but let me give you a sort of flavor of them, and they apply equally well here in the steel sector, or an important context for the steel sector decarbonization. The starting point is we need to be clear on our strategy. We need shared vision and shared goals and co-owned roadmaps. And by co-owned, I mean roadmaps that are bought into, co-developed, bought into by both the public and the private sector. And we need roadmaps at the international level, the national level and sectorial level. So that shared understanding is the crucial starting point if we're going to have a consistent approach to delivering this. There are a host of enabling conditions that are not receiving much attention right now that need the attention in the 2020s. That includes uh, energy supply infrastructure, renewable fuel supply infrastructure, working on the trading conditions because increasingly renewable fuels and renewable commodities will need to be traded, standards and certifications so that we know that these the, the fuels we're using and all the steel we're producing are clean green. We need work on business models, uh, ways of creating early demand and addressing competition distortions, and we do need further innovation, um, both in terms of addressing some of those gaps in capability, but more really about uh, driving down the cost and building confidence that uh, these technologies work uh, in different country contexts. And then lastly, the nature of all these industries and that very much the nature of steel is that these are internationally traded uh, products and collaboration on this uh, cross borders will be essential. No individual nation can hope to decarbonize its steel production alone. Uh, it needs to be interacting with the rest of the world and ideally creating some level playing field uh, to allow for the future trade in green hydrogen. A complex picture overall, we see encouraging signs that we're heading the right direction, but as is often the case, the pace is not there. We've only got a few demonstration projects. We need many, many more in the 2020s. This looks technically feasible, but it looks very complex to achieve. Um, so more attention, earlier action is crucial. And we and a variety of other agencies are working with some of the Pathfinder governments to map out what is needed over the coming years. Last slide, please. So um, just to share with you um, some of the upcoming analysis that we have that is relevant to this topic that you may be interested in. As I said at the outset, we're just starting to build an understanding of some of the key elements of this, but much more work is needed to delve into depth. Some of the things that we're working on are there up on the screen. Do look out for those. And we look forward to engaging with you in future discussions as we delve deeper into this topic. Thank you very much for your attention. Look forward to questions.
Thank you, Paul, for a, a very insightful presentation. Let me go directly to the questions. We have already received several ones. Very many thanks for them. I'll start with this one. Um, you've touched upon um, different uh, technologies during uh, your presentation to de decarbonize the iron and steel industry, but how far are these technologies from commercial deployment? And uh, what do you think that governments can do in order to advance their deployment at a large scale? Yeah. Um, well, I did touch on that in the presentation, but let me briefly expand upon it a little bit. So, um, as, as I say, technically, decarbonizing steel is very possible. These are not experimental lab-based technologies. They are uh, systems that, to some degree, have been operated in the real world. But what we haven't done is demonstrate them at scale in multiple uh, applications, in multiple different contexts, and with the sort of full supply chain, including the supply of the renewable fuels uh, and subsequent use of the, of the products beyond that. That is the missing piece in these technologies right now. We need many, many more demonstration projects um, with shared learning from those demonstrations in order to uh, build the confidence and the understanding necessary for the massive investments needed uh, further down the line. So in terms of actions, again, I touched on it very briefly, but uh, we think the most important things that governments should be doing right now is supporting, working with their industries to identify opportunities for early pilots, fostering sharing of knowledge and information between um, between governments and industry and also internationally. And that's one, one aspect. A second aspect is to try and drive early demand for green products, in this case, green steel. Creating the confidence to invest in the uh, in these early projects uh, is very much going to be driven by whether there is uh, a demand there for what will initially be higher cost uh, steel, and governments combined with industry can create early opportunities for that. And then lastly, these enabling conditions of we're going to need to trade this stuff. On what basis are we doing so? What are the standards and certification necessary to enable a global supply chain around this industry? Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, there is another question. Um, how can um, developing countries with a huge ore mining industry, industrial base like Zambia develop climate change resilient policies? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so I don't personally know Zambia's uh, situation uh, very well, um, but uh, you, the question alludes to Zambia having good iron ore resources, um, and I think Zambia also has uh, potential for excellent renewable resources, and that's potentially a really fantastic combination. So at the moment, iron ore is you know mined and shipped to, usually to somewhere else where it's then is then processed uh, into iron and, and into steel. Um, the hydrogen-based DRI process creates a new opportunity um, for localized DRI production. So as I said earlier, hydrogen DRI can be cost effective if the cost of the renewable electricity necessary to produce the hydrogen uh, if, the, if that cost is low. So in Zambia's case, perhaps, without knowing the specifics, there could be interesting opportunities uh, for using renewable resources to produce low-cost green hydrogen, using that green hydrogen to process the iron ore to DRI, and then that DRI can be exported elsewhere in the world for onward processing to steel. Steel production doesn't need to happen there, but the DRI could be shipped, and that potentially could be an interesting value add. That sort of thing allows countries with good iron ore resources to make use of them, whilst allowing other countries to um, manage and maintain their own steel production capability. Intriguing ideas. We did a study on this uh, looking specifically at Australia, and there may be some lessons from that that could be relevant to other countries. Um, thank you, Paul. There is actually another question that follows a bit of what you've just uh, touched upon on DRI. Um, of course, you've, you've uh, discussed it during your presentation, but maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Uh, the question goes, in regions where renewable power is cheap, what are the barriers faced by governments and private sector to switch to the DRI EAF route from its carbon intensive counterpart? And what are the ways they can be overcome? 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there are a host of barriers, obviously, with with deploying a new technology. But as I I said in my previous answers, um, this is not <laughs> this is still an experimental technology in the sense of it being not widely deployed at scale. But this is not a technically risky technology. So um, the starting point is got to be to consider a, some sort of pilot, first of kind deployment from which lessons can be learned. There are a number of such projects in Europe where uh, over the next couple of years, we'll start to get some insights into how they work operationally. And those lessons could have implications uh, for other deployments elsewhere. So um, yeah, I, I, I feel like perhaps my previous answers expanded upon that a little bit more. So maybe that's sufficient for now. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, unfortunately, time is up. Um, there were many um, insightful questions to choose from. Um, let me thank today's speaker for his captivating presentation and very pertinent questions we received from the audience. We hope that the insights of our colleague um, are of great value of, uh, for all of you. A couple of final announcements. Uh, to be able to reflect on the delivery of our webinar and ways to improve it, we would appreciate your feedback. We would like to invite you to complete a very short satisfactory survey, which will appear at the end of the webinar and which will be shared um, with you in the follow-up email. Thank you in advance. And uh, last but not least, uh, we would like to invite you all to our next edition of this webinar series on thermal energy storage, a key enabler of increased renewable penetration in energy systems. It will take place after the Christmas break on January 5th at 2 p.m. CET. You can already register on the ARENA website and the link will be again shared with you in our follow-up email. Once again, we thank you all for attending this webinar session. Goodbye and see you soon.